Amen. God bless you. Please grab a seat. We are in our fourth week as we're walking through the book of James, verse by verse. Yeah. Yeah, we can shut that off. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I uh, didn't interrupt too bad early in the message. We can get over that. But as we're walking through James, going through the basics, where we're looking at what is it to actually live our faith, to actually practically day by day live what we say we believe. Today we hit verse 19. James chapter 1. Can we just turn the freaking thing off? How about that? I mean, that's why we do the announcement slides, silence your phones when you come in, you interrupt the whole room. It's unnecessary. James chapter 1, verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. I got you. All of that was planned. I would never actually say that, but the phone ring, like we talked about it ahead of time, because some of you were just like, oh, dear God. You're already Googling, what church can I go to next Sunday? <laughs> but here's the reality. You don't even know the verse I read. Like, you weren't even paying attention. You didn't even know. Here's the reality. Often in life, there are things that happen that are annoying. Things that we just don't prefer, don't like. But sometimes, our reaction to goes so far beyond what happened that the focus then just becomes on how we react it. See, what I just did was I grabbed you, and in my response of anger, throwing a fit like a toddler, I pulled you into the emotions of the moment and made you feel something you did not want to feel today because of how I reacted. See, initially, when the phone started ringing, some of you were like, dadgummit, man, turn the phone. Like, you, you were with me, and my first response, you were like, okay, okay, okay. But then when it rang again, the stuff I said after that, you... you you started feeling bad for the phone person. Like, you started, like, dear God, that could happen to anybody. And it does. Last service, somebody came up to the end of service. I'm so sorry, my phone went off twice. Like, I know, that stuff happens. Like, silence your phone, but that stuff happens. I get it, I get it. It's happened to me, it's happened to you. But in the next few verses, James, the half-brother of Jesus, is going to share with us, and really, keep in mind, Bible is the Word of God, fully inspired by God, divinely written by God, through human people, through personalities, but it's the word of God coming through James. He's going to talk about something, and what we're going to read in these verses, listen, 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 you already know. I don't have some new epiphany to share this morning that's going to turn on a light in your life like nothing you've ever seen and bring some light to an area of your life where you're like, oh my gosh, everything we're going to talk about, we already know. This is basic. The problem is we know it, but we don't live it. There are a lot of things we know that we don't live. So we've called this series The Lost Art. The Lost Art is how to practically, actually live our faith day by day. We know what we believe. We just don't know what that looks like sometimes on a Tuesday afternoon or a Thursday morning. We know what our faith says we're supposed to do. We just don't always do it. The Lost Art is living our lives authentically in our faith as followers of Jesus. So let me read this verse again because you didn't hear it the first time. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And that word everyone in the Greek, you know what it means in the Greek? Everybody. It means everyone. In fact, in your Bible, if you have a Bible or on your phone, you could type the letters M-E, me. Like you can replace everyone with you. Everyone, that's you, that's me. Nobody gets a pass on this. Now keep in mind, he starts with my dear brothers and sisters. He's talking to people that are already Christ followers. Don't ever expect people that don't know Jesus to live like they do. He's talking to those of us that have invited Jesus to come in our lives. We're Christ followers. We're part of the family of God. So this is a, a family context, a family conversation. Dear family, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Your temper and your reactions communicate who you really are 
and how you view others. So how do we do this? We know what we're supposed to believe and what we're supposed to do, but practically, how do we do this? Everyone should be quick to listen. Are you a good listener? Listening, authentic listening, is for learning, not arguing. Some of you think you're good listeners, but all you're doing is you're listening to the context of what's being said, especially when you're in an argument, so you can figure out how to swing back. You're planning your next statement, and what they're saying, you're building the case in your mind. Oh, yeah, you said that. Well, I've got this to say to you, which wipes out what you just said. Listening, the purpose of it, authentic listening, is for learning, not arguing. We listen with a purpose to understand, not to defend ourselves or attack the other person. It happens all the time in the context of marriage. When you're in an argument in, in a marriage, because I've heard that some married people argue, that Angie doesn't like, we, we, it's great, but I, I've read some people, no, we, we have had some, we don't call them arguments, we call them discussions. We've had some discussions when I've been wrong about things and she has thoroughly corrected me. But, but in a marriage, because I need that, in a marriage, in an argument, you have to ask yourself the question. Now, this, this question demands a level of maturity. This is not a question a toddler would ask. This is not a question an immature person would ask. But if you're mature, if you're self-aware, if you're growing as a human being, and especially as a Christ follower, am I honestly trying to understand my spouse? Because the reality is you can win arguments and lose the marriage. People leave people they love all the time because they just can't take it anymore. And if you win the arguments, if what you win causes you to lose, are you really winning? One of the things that's very helpful when you're in an argument with your spouse or somebody you love, somebody you care about, one of the things that's helpful is think about life beyond this moment. Think about life beyond the argument. Are there ever times, guys, because, because men do this, I don't know about women, I'm not going to talk to women about this. I'm just talk to guys because it's safer that way. But guys, is there ever that thing you think, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm going to let her keep going because I'm going to say this. And when I say this, it's the atomic bomb in the conversation. She is going to shut the fat up. I just keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay, boom. And have you ever said it? And the minute you said it, you're like, oh crap. <laughs> Always wanted to be celibate the rest of my life. That's <laughs> like there are moments... <laughs> There are moments you, you just, the minute you say it, you know, I shouldn't have gone there. And when we do that, we're not thinking about life beyond the argument. Here's the reality. If you're not authentically listening, you're not loving. It is impossible to love someone and not listen to them. And, and listening, by the way, listening, listening is not, it's not this. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Oh, what? That's not listening. That's doing as little as you possibly can to act like you're engaged and you care. It's not listening. Listening is when I lock eyes, when I'm fully engaged, when I'm paying attention to what's being said, when I'm, when I'm focused on what you're communicating and I'm processing and I'm thinking through what you're saying. To truly live our faith, if you're a follower of Jesus, I'm a follower of Jesus, to truly live our faith, we have to love others. It's a primary characteristic of Christ's followers, how we love others. Jesus even commanded that we love each other as he loved us, that we will be known by our love for one another. All, all that is Bible. So when we listen, then we begin to understand the other person's perspective. We begin to know a little bit more about their background. When you listen to people, you know them better. And it's here that you and I begin to understand in a deeper, more meaningful way, the essence of someone we say we love. Listening. So if I want to engage in listening better, there are some questions I'm going to ask, especially in the context of an argument, especially in those moments where emotions are high. James chapter 1, let, let's remember the journey of where we be, began. He said, you're going to face trials of all kinds. And as you do, as we face trials, we talked about last week how we're more open and vulnerable to temptation. And one of the temptations when life is under pressure and we're stressed and we're facing some challenges and there's some difficult days, one of the things that's often tempting in our lives is to just be angry and to lash out. You've heard the phrase, 
hurt people hurt people. So here are some questions. If you're in that moment and you're in an argument and you're trying, you're trying to push the anger down, you're trying to function in a mature way as a follower of Jesus, in a way that loves God and loves the other person, first question, where's the pain really coming from? Most arguments are not about a pain that was born in that moment. They're about a pain that's been there for a long time, and sometimes you did not bring the pain to the party. Someone else did. But that person is still living, processing a kind of pain that makes them sensitive in the area of whatever it is you're arguing about. Another question, what are they going through? What are they right, right now that would cause them to respond like that, to talk to me like that? What, what are they going through? What are they feeling? And why are they feeling what they're feeling? The more you listen to someone, the more you discover what's inside, who they really are. And here's what's interesting. The Holy Spirit of God through James says, be quick to listen. Be slow to speak. Because sometimes talking interrupts the very thing we're chasing because what we're chasing is only found in listening. Without listening, there's no understanding. Without listening, there's no deeper connection in the relationship. Without listening, you have no credibility. Why should someone else listen to you if you won't listen to them? Listening earns you the opportunity to be heard. And in broken marriages, nobody listens. It's part of why they're broken. And if you don't listen, your spouse will eventually stop talking. Parents, if you don't listen, your kids will eventually stop talking. Years ago, if you've been a part of C3 for any time, you, you're familiar with my life story, with what's happened with me and Angie. Our marriage was in trouble. I thought it was 2010. She reminded me after the last service, it was 2009. We went to a marriage intensive in Colorado. This was a counselor, multiple PhDs, a person that everything about what they did in this intensive was built for marriages in crisis. Marriages where like, it's done, it's over, this is your last shot, let's see, maybe. So we went, and it was a little over a week that we were out there for, I believe it was about 23 sessions. Each session was an hour to an hour and a half. And to begin those sessions, before we began and, and went into all the sessions, the therapist met with Angie and me separately in two different appointments. And he said to me, for the first 22 sessions, we're going to let Angie talk and you listen. 22 freaking sessions? It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. It's probably harder than giving birth. I don't know. I've never done it. But <laughs> 22 sessions to just take it, take it, take it. We're already in a bad place. Obviously, we're at a crisis marriage. Per a, a pastor, like, I I'm trying to help other people know how to live their lives, and I can't even get mine together. I I I'm already in this place, and, and I want to defend and I want to correct, no, 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 that's not how I remember it. Now, I wanted to argue. I wanted to respond. Well, yeah, maybe that's true, but what you don't understand is, and I, I couldn't. For 22 unbelievable sessions, I had to shut up and listen. But can I tell you, for the first time, I began to hear something deeper than her words. I heard her pain. I heard her hurt. I heard her frustration. It wasn't until I listened that I heard and actually began to understand how much my selfishness and my thoughtlessness had contributed to our issues and to her pain. She had a lot of pain from before I even met her. She had a lot of things that she dealt with in her life. And so I did not initially bring the pain to her, but I did function in a way that accentuated and elevated that pain and made it even more damaging. 
It's when I was listening to her that I was better able to pray for her and ask God for wisdom and how to love her best. It's because of listening that I finally realized I'm the one person on earth that has the opportunity to love her in a way that's healing and can have a profound life-giving effect in helping her. 22 sessions that were brutal. But I learned something I wouldn't have learned any other way. My dear brothers and sisters, Christ followers, the church, the Spirit of God through James says you need some help in knowing how to love each other. And you need to realize you're being watched and seen by those around you who don't know Jesus. Be quick to listen. Slow to speak. Today, if you're married. Today. If you want to start loving your spouse better, if, if you want to start kind of a new path in your relationship that can take it places you've not been before, today, if you want to start loving your spouse better, start listening better. Any relationship that you want to elevate, become a better listener. And listen with the purpose of understanding. But there's another thing I notice. Sir, ma'am, if you don't start listening today, they won't listen tomorrow. Needs cannot be met when they're not expressed. Expectations cannot be met when they're not expressed. If you do that thing, if you do that thing, mm, if you do that thing where somebody says, what's wrong? Well, if you don't know, I'm not telling you. Good God Almighty. That makes me want to just slap a monkey. Like, what, what do I do with that? Not that that's ever happened. But <laughs> needs, needs can't be met when they're not expressed. Expectations can't be met when they're not expressed. But neither can they be addressed and met if we're not listening to what is expressed. That's why two people can sit in front of a therapist and one says, I've been saying this for years. And the other says, I've never heard that. And neither one of them are lying. You've got to listen so they feel the freedom to talk. Do you remember the last time you actually listened to your spouse? I mean, truly listened. The reason that's so important is because it is impossible to feel loved when you're not being listened to. And parents, if you don't listen to your kids today, they won't listen to you in their tomorrows. As a parent, let me tell you the secret of parenting. Not that I have it down. I don't have it down. I've just discovered the secret. Because parenting, the hardest thing about parenting is consistency. You meet those parents, the kids do something wrong, they start counting one, two, and I'm thinking, how high are we going? Like, where does this end? Because the kids learn that pattern. But the whole idea of parenting, it really all, all you have as a parent is influence. That's the secret. At some ages when they're younger, you have more influence. As they get older, you have less. When they're younger, you can, you can enforce the influence. When they're older, you can't enforce it. All you have in parenting really is influence. So are you living in a way in how you listen where you're increasing your influence in their lives or you're diminishing your influence in their lives? Listening increases your influence where your kids as they grow older will want to know what you have to say. And it's not always easy. I remember one of our kids when they were little, they would, they would go online and play this game. Um, I'm not going to tell you which kid, but almost every time he got online, Ethan would jump on Minecraft. <laughs> now, I don't know if you've seen Minecraft. Like, the graphics feel like they're from 20 years ago. The game is simple. I, I don't understand it to save my life. A couple times I thought, let me try this. I, like, who cares? I couldn't care less, but my boy was consumed with Minecraft and loved it. So there were a number of occasions we had conversations about Minecraft, and I couldn't care less. I mean, as a parent, part of what we have to do is listen to some things that we don't necessarily care about. 
See, loving someone is being listened to things you don't care about that come from someone you do care about. As a parent, I mean, all of our kids, all the ages, the different interests, the different things, so many conversations that on the inside, I'm dying. I'm like, oh my God. And you're thinking, you're a horrible parent. No, I'm just honest. Like, there's stuff, I, I have discussed things and heard things that I don't give a rip about, but I love the person. And let me tell you what it's done. There are a lot of things I've done wrong. I mean, I, I could share, the resume of what I've done wrong is much lo- longer than what I've done right. But I need to tell you, when you listen to your kids, one of the things by the grace of God that I'm so grateful for, all of my kids are adults now, and when life goes wheels off, or they're facing a big problem or a major decision, or there's something they're processing, they call me. As a parent, there's nothing more precious. But if you don't listen now, even to some things that don't matter, they won't listen later. You invest through listening now for the day that you'll want to be and need to be heard. So parents, do you talk with your kids? Do you really talk with your kids? And before you answer that, if we're not careful as parents, our talking with our kids is really more talking at our kids. If we're not careful as parents, we're giving a whole lot of information about how the room needs to be kept and when the homework needs to be done and how to treat their siblings. A whole lot of information and very little inspiration. There's a big difference in talking with your kids and talking at your kids. Do you talk with your kids, which requires listening? Students, one of the wisest things you could ever do in life is listen to your parents. I... I understand they have a Ph.D. in stupid in some areas. I get that. But the reality is I do, you do, we all do. None of us have arrived. But when you listen to your parents, you're you're listening to the only person or one of the only two people on planet Earth that would actually die for you. Somebody whose entire motivation is your best interest. Well, but you don't understand who my dad is. You don't understand who my mom is, how hypocritical they are. Are you perfect? You find no place in Scripture where the requirement to listen to parents is perfection on their part. One of the hardest things I have to do as a dad, as our kids were growing up especially, one of the hardest things I have to do as a dad is address something in the life of my child that I also struggle with in my life. But I can't allow the fact that I have not arrived yet to feed into my pride and cause me not to address something that needs to be addressed for their best interest. And when I address it, I'm not addressing it saying, be like me. I'm addressing it saying, let's be like Jesus. I struggle too. Students, one of the wisest things you could do is listen to your parents and do not expect perfection to lend credibility because they're not perfect. And one day you'll understand the weight of another life and you're not going to get it right all the time. But they're in your corner. They're, They're occasional exceptions but most parents want the best for their kids. So listen, they've made some mistakes that you don't have to. Verse 19, and slow to become angry because human anger, not anger, human anger, does not produce the righteousness that God desires. See, your life reveals who you really are. Anger is both a revealer and a predictor. How we respond in anger reveals our character. How I respond to you in anger reveals what I really think about you. Do I really value you? Do I, do I love you with an understanding that every single person I lock eyes with is deeply loved by God, even people that don't agree with me about anything? So how I respond reveals, the level of anger reveals my character and how I view God and obey Him and how I view people. Anger is also a predictor. If you're constantly reacting and your temper gets the best of you and you're constantly angry, it is a predictor. You are going on a crazy ride, the crazy train of emotion. Your life will be all over the place. And the unfortunate thing about that is you take the people that you love the most along with you. Anger is a revealer and a predictor. It's a temperature gauge. The temperature gauge of your life. And some of you, some of you run hot. You're angry. 
And then verse 21. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Moral filth and evil. He's talking about being quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. And then he ties in moral filth. Where does moral filth and evil come from? Your mouth, your heart, and your attitude. The anger that you allow to reign in your life that causes you to love somebody less than God requires you and I love them as Christ followers. God says, when you read the passage in context and the way you interpret Scripture is by Scripture, so you take it in context and what the verses are saying, the moral filth and evil that he's talking about are when we allow anger to reign in our lives and and we pop off with the excuse of, that's just how I am. I'm just wound tight. I just respond. I just say what I think. No, you're just a jackass. Biblical word, King James, look it up. And everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. Like, you're the problem. They all emailed me. It's why we're here today. It's an intervention. Not really. Nobody emailed me. (laughs) But if Jesus is God, and you've invited him into your life, and he's big enough and powerful enough to forgive you of your sin, is he not big enough and powerful enough to change the areas of your personality that are less than what they need to be? It is not an excuse. In fact, it is weak-minded and a weak person that says, It's just how I am. It's just how I'm wired. God's supposed to be bigger than that. And accepting God's word into your life, the Bible says, can save you. So faith, how I practically live this, faith isn't where you go on Sunday or a label you wear on a survey. Faith is how you live every single day. How you're becoming more like Jesus in your attitude and and with your temper. Well, wait a minute. Jesus got angry. Yeah, he did. He did. There are a couple of times very clear in Scripture, Jesus got angry angry. But here's what's interesting. In the New Testament, we have over 60 times that reveal the emotional state of Jesus, how he was feeling, how he was processing. And the number one, compassion, the number one emotion he, he reveals in all the New Testament is compassion, which is slow to anger. But he did get really angry a couple of times and react. But what's interesting about Jesus, he gets angry at our sin when it harms others. We're angry about a lot today. We wake up angry. We're angry about what's happening in the world. We're angry about what's happening in our country. We're angry about the people that disagree with us and vote differently. We're we're angry. Every day is a new opportunity to be offended by somebody and take action. We're on ready all the time because of how angry we are. But the reality is followers of Jesus, according to what Scripture teaches, the sin that we should be the angriest about is our own. Godly anger is always with the motivation for helping others. Godly anger is always in defense of someone else. Ungodly anger, sinful anger, human anger, is for myself when I've been wronged. So the arguments that you get into with your spouse, the arguments you get into with your kids or with your parents, is it because there's harm coming to somebody else Or is it because you're just reacting because they did something differently than you would and you just have a temper about it? Is it for someone else's better or is it because you're offended? And I need to ask you another question. And this one, this is going to be a fun one. Your social media, your Instagram, are you slow to speak and quick to listen? If you're quick to listen, stop it with the selfies. The duck face, the three views, the like you look at the feed and it's all selfie. You need help. You need somebody to tell you you matter. Jesus loves you. It's going to be okay. You don't need that much attention. It's going to be all right. I'm just telling you the truth. But does what other people post on social media, does it make you angry? Does it make you too angry? James tells us when we walk through trials and we're all going to go through them, when life is full of pressure and our emotions are raw, and we're strained by what's happening in life, and it feels intense, and we're angry about it. Something triggers us and and fires off that anger, often on social media. And immediately, we can communicate everything we're feeling about whoever or whatever. Every day, we wake up ready to go. You've got the phone. You're attached. You're ready to go. We're jumping into comments. We're jabbing with people all over the world. Some Some of you fight with people you don't even know. Like, who cares? The amount of people you're allowing to step into your life and control your life because of the stuff you look at and how it makes you angry. If it takes you to that place of anger, maybe, maybe the wise thing to do is just back off for a little bit. 
Just step away for a minute. It's almost like every day, hey, what, what are we all going to throw a fit about today? What are we all going to be mad about today? Who, who are we attacking today? And here's the thing you need to know about social media, about the world we live in. Here's what you need to know. Technology is amazing. But one of the things we all need to be aware of all the time, especially when we're angry, is technology. It is instant. It is constant. It is global. And it is permanent. It is instant. Have you ever fired off a text and then thought, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that? Maturity is slow to speak. Process first. Pray for first. Because what may feel good in the moment probably won't feel good in your tomorrows. You just showed a side of you that felt good, but that feeling good is going to go away. Years ago, Ashley and Stephen were dating, our daughter Ashley, and they were going to the movies at, at Regal Cinema at Waterford, and they were going to take Ashley's car, but Stephen wanted to drive. I said, no problem. They're dating. He can, he can drive her car. They went to the movies. They're coming out of the movies. They're pulling out of the parking lot, and some car backs up full speed and slams into them. And the girl driving the car happened to go to C3. So I called her dad and I said, hey, there was this accident. I'm sure you heard about it. And he, he was pretty defensive. He's like, yeah, you heard about it. Here's what you need to know. This young lady was too young to drive. She did not have a driver's license. And I said, well, I'm going to call my insurance company. We've got to get this fixed. We need to rent a car while it's getting fixed. I mean, it, it was a mess. And um, this man starts going off on me on the phone. Talking about, I mean, people take cheap shot. You're a pastor. You're greedy. You're selfish. This isn't what God would do. Dude, you hadn't darkened the door of a church in 30 years. You're going to tell me what God would do? Okay, okay, okay. But my temper got to me. Because he's telling me, please don't call insurance. I'll lose my job because she doesn't have a license yet. And I'm a driver and I'm going to lose my job if you, if you call insurance. And I'll, I'll just, I got a couple buddies that own body shops. I'll have one of them fix it. Oh, no, you won't. I'm taking it somewhere where I know it's going to be done right. Well, don't, don't rent a car. You can borrow one of my cars. I'm not paying for you to rent a car. I'm not borrowing your car. I don't know you. You can accuse me of anything if I drive your car. I'm not borrowing your car. And it just escalated and escalated and escalated. And part of what I do is communicate for a living. And I I flipped my lid. And I sliced and diced him. I think everybody on the street left home for a few minutes. I mean, it it got ugly. Felt good in the moment, but it got ugly. I told him exactly what I thought of him. Hung up the phone. Walked in the house. And immediately it was like something inside. You going to invite him to church Sunday? It's called the Holy Spirit. He shows up sometimes at the most inconvenient moments. I just got through telling this guy, man, you need to learn how to be a freaking dad and make sure your daughter's not driving without a license. Put on your big boy pants. Be a man. You accept responsibility. I mean, I'm not telling you everything I said. I'm telling you the clean part. I walked out the front door with my phone. I picked up the phone. I called him back. I'm shocked he answered. I said, I'm so sorry. My temper got the best of me. I shouldn't have talked to you like that. I apologize. Would you please forgive me? I went too far. You're a human being. These are cars. Both of our kids are fine. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry too. It's amazing how when you soften up, most people, rational people soften. I'm sorry too, yeah. You go ahead and and, and rent the car. Text me how much it is. I'll send you the money. That was years ago. I've never seen the money. Separate issue. But I'm working that through this morning. Feel a bit better talking about it. But what I'm talking about, listen, This is one of the most personally convicting messages I've ever preached. Because I am wired to fight. I mean, I I have to watch my emotions. Have you noticed how in Avalon, if you live in Avalon, they have these signs they've put up that said, don't park on this side of the street, and nobody freaking looks at them or pays attention to them, and nobody's enforcing it. And when you're driving, you're supposed to wait for the other. This is a lesson. Some of you don't know this. When you're driving, if a car is coming and you're on the side where cars are parked, you're supposed to wait until they go by before you go out there and then act like you've got it and you're honking at somebody. That will get you punched in the throat. I've almost done it twice this week. Like, there's just always stuff that just, like, is right there. And some of you are like that. It's instant, it's constant, it's global. What you post something on somebody else, somebody else on the other side of the world can jump in and agree with you or disagree, and it's permanent. One of the things, one of the things I thank God for is there was no social media when I was in high school. 
Thank you, Jesus. I mean, I'm so grateful. I'd have gone to prison 12 times a month. Like, I'm so glad. But students, you've got to realize it is permanent. And then some of you, when it comes to anger, you, you, here's your thought. Well, I, you know, I, I still deal with it some, but I'm better than I used to be. I, I'm not as angry as I used to be. I don't get angry that often anymore. Two, three times a year. A grenade is a quick event. But the devastation is long term. Who is it that's living with the shrapnel of your anger walking around in their lives? That was eight years ago, 12 years ago I said that. There is no expiration date on words that cause pain. You took the relationship to that address. You do not get to decide how long you stay there. What we get angry about is all about our perspective of life. If it's about me, I'm going to speak first and get angry a lot if I'm selfish. If it's about you, I'm going to listen first and seek to understand. So when you're feeling angry and you're in an argument or you're about to go into an argument, filter your anger through a couple of questions. When you're triggered, you're angry, something has set you off, filter your anger through a couple of questions. The first one is this. In this argument, do you want to make a point or do you want to make a difference? They're two different things. It's easy to make a point. It's more challenging to make a difference. Number two, do you want to be a critic or a coach? Here's what's interesting about critics and coaches. The critic in the stands that's going to scream and yell about the play they just saw, saw the exact same thing the coach on the sideline saw that he's going to try to coach up and help the player with. Critics and coaches see the same thing. They react entirely differently. To those you love, to the people in your family, to the closest friends, to your spouse, to your kids, to your parents, are you a critic or a coach? Critics walk in anger. Coaches walk in love. And parents, by the way, your, your children, they have plenty of critics. They need a coach. Because as a critic, you can win arguments and lose relationships. They need a coach. Somebody say, yeah, yeah, I, I know you messed that play up, but here's how you recover. Here's how you do it better next time. Here's what this looks like. I believe in you and I know you can do it. I'll walk with you through it. Number three, will we keep private things private or make them public? Often in anger, we take things that should be private and make them public. A couple's going through a divorce. And one of them decides to post something nasty on social media about the other one. Failing to think about the fact you have children together and those children call your spouse or your ex mom or dad. Some things need to remain private and you need to have the maturity and the strength of character to keep it private. There's a big difference in secrecy and privacy. Secrets are things we hide. That's unhealthy. Privacy are the things that are none your business. And it needs to stay that way. Unhealthy anger will destroy everything that matters most to you, including you. So quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word of God planted in you, which can save you. So rather than yelling at them, what if we open God's word and listen to him? As a parent, a father of four kids... Incredible kids by the grace of God. All of our kids are in ministry, serving the local church, making a difference for their lives. I'm extremely grateful. I don't deserve that. That's the grace of God. But as a parent of four grown kids, if I could go back in time and change one thing, there are several. But toward the top of the list would be this. I would listen more. I would listen faster. I would listen more when they were younger. I would listen seeking to understand. I would listen and process before reacting. I would listen. Because the best vehicle that love rides in is listening. So, sir, how would your marriage change if you listened more? And spoke less. I know you got stuff to say. But what if you just didn't? 
Everything you say should be true, but not everything that's true should be said. What if you just shut the fat up? Ma'am, how would your marriage change? I, I know you got a list, and it's a long one, and we would all agree with your list. But how would your marriage change if you listened more and spoke less? Parents, how would your home change if you listened more and spoke less? Students, how would your friendships change? And how much would it dramatically help the future you to put a pattern in place of listening more and speaking less? This is the thing that the you of 10 years from now would give the you of today a standing ovation for if you build it into your life. So as followers of Jesus, we call ourselves Christ followers. What do we do this week about this? Because following Jesus is following the teaching and example of Jesus. Well, he, he lived with open ears. Listen more this week. He had a controlled tongue. Tame that thing. The Bible says your tongue has the power of life and death. He had a calm spirit. He was passionate, but there was a calmness about his spirit. He kept anger in check. He had a clean heart. I'm going to make sure that I do not devalue any person I encounter because every single person I lock eyes with is deeply loved by God just as much as he loves me. And he had a humble attitude. He's a king. He's a savior. And he left heaven to come to earth for us. So this week, Open ears, controlled tongue, calm spirit, clean heart, humble attitude. Man, I, can't, I can't do that. Hey, it's all about a pursuit. It's not about perfection. In my life, I'm going to focus on these. I'm going to put them on the mirror. I'm going to put them on a card in my car. I'm going to be looking at this. And I'm going to try to build a pattern and a default position in my life of functioning this way day by day. And I'm going to blow it at times. But here's what's going to happen. If you bring intentionality to your behavior and your thinking and your patterns, six months from now, you won't be where you could be, but you won't be where you were. And it'll create a pattern of following Jesus practically and exercising your faith day by day. Would you pray with me this morning? Heads bowed and eyes closed. Some of you, the biggest thing you need to do is to be quick to listen to the Spirit of God in your life this morning saying, you need to give your life to Jesus. Like everything we've talked about today is impossible unless you know God in a personal way and His Spirit lives inside you to help you live this way. You can't do this. I can't do this in and of ourselves. It takes God doing it in your life. So if that's the step you need to take, you need to invite Jesus to come into your life, I'd love to lead you in a very simple prayer. If you'd like to invite Jesus to come into your life to forgive your sin, to give you a home in heaven after this life, to give you His Spirit living inside you, to grow you and mature you in these areas, then you just pray this prayer. You can pray it out loud or you can pray it quietly in your heart. Just say, Dear God, I know that I need you. Jesus, please come into my life. Forgive my sin and help me to live for you. As best I know how, I give my life to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Thank you so much for joining us. If you just prayed that prayer, we would love to know it. You can text your name to 407-487-8311 and Pastor Byron will be praying for you this week. And also, we want to thank you for your faithful generosity. You can go to giveC3.cc or you can text C3Orlando to 77977. Thank you so much for how you give. And if you are in Central Florida, please join us in person at our campus at 9.30 or 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Have a great week.